Welcome to Planet Doug behind the scenes for Sunday, October 8th, about a quarter after 10 in the morning, enjoying a cup of coffee. I've already I've been up for quite a while this morning and I've been busy doing things on my computer, editing another video from Sumatra in particular, but I felt like I wanted to chat a little bit about a few things that are on my mind. Um, oddly enough, one of the main things I've been thinking about for the last couple of days is Japan and World War II, you know, the Japanese campaign in the Pacific and then the Americans entering the war and then the, you know, the protracted fighting between the Americans and the Japanese in the Pacific. And the reason I've been thinking about that a lot is because of a couple of comments on one of my uh, recent videos. It was the video where I went to uh, the park in Padang. There's a peninsula coming off the river with a hill and they built a very nice park up on that hill. And as you climb up into the, uh, the park, you follow a trail, you pass a couple of Japanese gun emplacements from World War II. And in my video, I was talking about a video shot by an American, uh, a YouTuber, travel vlogger named Angelina, and she shot quite a few videos from Padang. And in one of her videos, she had some kind of a guide with her, and they went up into this park, and they stopped at this, you know, the gun emplacements as well, or she talked about them at least. I can't remember whether she showed them in her video or not. And her guide said to her that to build these gun emplacements, you know, it's a big gun commanding the, the harbor or the, you know, the entrance into the river of uh, Padang. And he said that the Japanese used local labor and when the construction was completed, the Japanese wanted to keep it a secret, you know, what these guns were like and where exactly they were placed. So the Japanese executed all of the workers, like the whole construction crew that built the uh, gun emplacement, all the Indonesian workers, the Japanese killed them all so that they couldn't talk about what they had built. And I had heard the same story from Bukatingi. In Bukatingi, there's a very extensive underground tunnel complex. It's huge. I, I couldn't believe it when I saw it. It was very interesting built into the the rocky cliffs of the uh, canyon that sits on the edge of uh, the city of Bukatingi. And it's open to the public now. It's, it's a tourist attraction to go see this tunnel complex. You can go inside and it, it, it is, as I said, very extensive. It's a large, the tunnels were massive. I was really surprised at how big they were. And the story you're told by the guides there and by local people is that when the construction of this tunnel complex was completed, the Japanese executed all of the Indonesian workers, just massacred them in order to keep this tunnel complex a secret. And so that information about them, their placement, the number of soldiers inside, like any information about the tunnels couldn't be passed on to the allies. So the Japanese killed all the workers. And in my video, I think the video I called it Star-Crossed Lovers, because there's a story about some uh, a woman who killed herself in that park. So anyway, I told that story as well. So I called the video Star-Crossed Lovers. If you want to look for it, that's the video. And in that video, I mentioned this story about the Japanese killing all the Indonesian laborers. And I said that I questioned whether that story was true or not. And I, ended, I got two comments on my video uh, about what I said. One, I believe, was from a, an Indonesian man. I just, I, it's all in English, of course, but I think it's a, a man from Indonesia. And then another comment from someone I don't know who. And then I have the, the two comments here. I'll, I'll read them. Um, so they're a little bit long comments. Maybe I'll put them up on the screen as well. The first one is from at man3k, but I, I don't know who that is. But um, he says, 
whether it's war tunnel or forced railroad construction, both has happened in the past in Indonesia and Malaysia. I've often heard stories of young villagers taken from their families. It was said that they had to marry their young ones as early as 10 or 11 years old so that they aren't taken for forced labor, though I don't know the justification behind it. It is no secret that some of our elders were killed, tortured, or skinned alive during the time. Ask the Indonesians how they came up with the idea of killing Japanese soldiers with sharpened bamboos if you don't believe me. Perhaps you were thinking how such disciplined and well-mannered Japanese people are capable of those atrocities. The answer is simple. The generation of today are different from their forefathers that were descendants of warring states period. They have lost the war and those left behind are taught to revive country economically. Most of the Japanese today don't even know the atrocities their forefathers did as they weren't taught it in schools. And to be frank, the generations of Indonesia and Malaysia today has also forgiven them and start anew. Forgiven but not forgotten. So it's a very uh, interesting comment, very, very polite and, and very informative. Um, but of course the first thing that jumped out at me is that the comment had nothing to do with what I said, right? He, like he was talking about, okay, the Japanese committed, you know, this atrocity and this atrocity and this atrocity, and they used forced labor and they killed some of the men and they did this to them and they did that to them. And my response in my reply was more or less, well, yes, all of that is well documented the Japanese military did commit a lot of atrocities across Asia and they, they did this and they did this and they did this and they, had, they used forced labor. Yes, yes, yes and yes. However, that's not what I was talking about. I was not doubting any of that. It's all well documented in history what happened. I was doubting this one specific story that the Japanese killed all the laborers who built this gun emplacement and then the tunnels in Bukatingi. That's what I said. You know, I don't doubt any of the stories from World War II. I mean, they're all very well known, you know, the Japanese, you know, constructing the death railways in Thailand and how many thousands of soldiers, POWs and local people died constructing the railways, you know, the POW camps all across Asia where a lot of the POWs were abused and they died in the camps. The forced marches you know, in the Philippines and other places where a lot of, you know, soldiers died during these forced marches. You know, they used conscripted labor in Indonesia. You know, I actually, ironically, I know a fair bit about that because I've had a lifelong interest in, this, in the topic. Um, I've read lots of books about it. Every time I've been able to track down any kind of an article or a documentary or even a YouTube video or a book or a memoir or even fictional books about this topic, about the, you know, the Japanese um, soldiers in, in Asia, I just sort of devoured that stuff in my lifetime because I've always found it quite interesting. And I've had the opportunity to visit a few of these sites when I went to uh, Palawan in the Philippines, you know, the island of Palawan, there is a site there, a POW camp, where they used soldiers, you know, prisoners of war, to build airfields and things like that. And then there's a very well-known account where the Allies, you know, were invading and were going to take over that area of Palawan, and the Japanese uh, the people running the POW camp got an order from higher up telling them to kill the prisoners, like before the Allies overrun the area, kill the prisoners so that the prisoners can't then rejoin the armed forces and fight against the Japanese again. So yeah, they were given orders to kill the prisoners. And um, yeah, it was a really horrific story. The prisoners were forced into these big ditches that they had dug. And then, according to what I read, you know, the history, the Japanese poured diesel or gasoline into the trenches and then lit it on fire, basically to burn them alive. And then all the soldiers, the POWs that 
got out of the ditches and, and ran, um, they were just shot down. They were machine gunned. So a, a total of 139 POWs were killed by the Japanese at that time. And when I went to Palawan, I'd been there two or three times, I could go visit that place. There's now a memorial to these men and what happened. And you can read a lot about, a lot of individual stories about some of the POWs who survived. The POWs from that camp and there were many escape attempts and they would escape and then go out into the Philippine villages and the local people would hide them or hide them from the Japanese and there's a lot of very interesting stories about that POW camp and what happened you know during this massacre and in Taiwan I visited a place called Kinkaseki a fascinating place because the the Japanese had 14, I think, 14 prisoner of war camps in Taiwan. And their story, their history is not as well known as the prisoner of war camps in the Philippines and in Singapore, places like that. But um, yeah, a lot happened there. So they had these 14 POW camps. Uh, and a lot of these prisoners were actually from the Singapore uh, area when the Allies surrendered to the Japanese and then the soldiers were put on ships. I think they called the ships hell ships because the conditions inside them were so brutal. You know, prisoners were dying inside the ships just because of the heat and, and then, you know, the horrible conditions inside the ships. But anyway, these hell ships would bring them to Taiwan and other places, put them into these labor camps and then the POWs were put to work for the Japanese. And one of these camps is just outside of uh, Taipei in a place, uh, the, it's called Kinkaseki, and the name of the town there, Jingguashu, very famous tourist town now in Taiwan. But there is a uh, copper mine there. And the POWs were put to work in the copper mines and the working conditions were brutal, absolutely brutal. And of course the men in the camps were not given enough food to eat. Um, the water was contaminated, they got sick from the water. You know, the work in the mines was dangerous and, and, and brutally difficult. Um, and there was very little medical care. So a lot of the men in the camp died and uh, you can go there now. There's a big monument to these, all the men who died. There's a very elaborate website you can find online about King Kaseki and the prisoner of war camps in Taiwan, giving the history of all these camps. And every year there's a memorial service at King Kaseki where, you know, men, families of the men who died and, and people who are part of that history would gather and have a memorial service uh, every year. So I, you know, I mean, I had a chance to uh, go there and, and see the memorial. And I did a lot of reading about Kinkaseki. And there are a lot of um, like fictional books. I remember one called King Rat. James Clavell was he the author? Have I got that name right? Uh, you know, called King Rat, and it's kind. It's a novel about the POW camps run by the Japanese in Singapore, but I think. The story is largely based on his own experiences in that camp or the experiences of real prisoners there. I haven't looked this up for this behind the scenes video, so I don't have the facts straight, but I do remember King Rat making a big impression on me. Anyway, whenever I come across any kind of a memoir or novelization or documentary about the Japanese labor camps and prisoner war camps, I, I find them interesting, so I've actually done a lot of reading about it. And so when I went to these places like in Bukatingi and in Padang and everyone was saying that the Japanese massacred all the laborers when the work was done, I kind of went, I don't know about that because and in all of that information, all of the books, all of the online articles, everything, there is not one mention of the Japanese killing all the laborers when the job was done. So because of all that, that's why in the video I said, yeah, this story about them killing everybody when the job was done, 
Um, I kind of, I doubt that it's true. I mentioned that there were uh, two comments and I, I suppose I'll give the uh, second comment uh, a reading because it's, it's similar to the first. I mean, the first one from this Indonesian man, I believe, was very thought out and, 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 and well considered and polite. This one is a little bit more direct and a little bit more to the point. But this person says, you seem to really underestimate what the Japanese did in Indonesia during the occupation. I mean, you know the Japanese during World War II, right? What they did to the Chinese, what they did to the Koreans, what they did to the Filipinos. What makes you think the Japanese didn't do the same thing to Indonesians? Come on, man. Just because you haven't found the legitimate source doesn't mean it's not happening. So pretty much everything I said about the first comment applies to this one as well, but perhaps even more so because, you know, he, he's saying, like, come on, you know, the Japanese are fully capable of doing this. You know, think about what they did in China, what they did in the Philippines. What, of course, they're going to do the same thing in Indonesia. So again, when I, I wrote back to him as well, I get quite a, lot, quite a lengthy reply going over a lot of these points that I'm talking about here, basically saying was, yeah, I'm, I know that the Japanese military at that time was fully capable of doing these things. And I know all about what they did in China, <clears throat> what they did in Korea, the Philippines, all these places. It's all well known and, and documented. But I'm not talking about any of that. I'm not talking about whether they are capable of doing it, but I'm talking about did they do it? This one particular act of killing the laborers in Indonesia that built this gun emplacement, did that actually happen? And again, I, you know, I'm, it could easily have happened. It's like I said, um, nothing that the Japanese military at that time wasn't capable of doing. But again, it feels like if it happened, there would be at least a mention of it. And there just isn't that I've been able to come across. Um, actually, the first comment I replied to this the Indonesian man, and then he replied to my reply, and he did make an interesting comment. He said something about how all the things that I talked about I'm talking about sources in English, right? They're English books, English movies, English memoirs, English websites, English online articles, English Wikipedia articles. And he's saying that, well, um, we may not be as, in Indonesia, we're not as, well, as aware of all these things as you are because, yeah, it's your language. And I started thinking about that and I'm like, well, yeah, you know, you've got a point. But again, I'm not aware of anything in Indonesian either. Like when you do Google searches, you, you get Indonesian results and English results. And uh, there was no mention anywhere in, in the Indonesian sources about these sorts of massacres either, you know, massacring entire labor forces when the job was done. And I started to think about this lack of documentation in Indonesian, because when I went to the tunnel complex in Bukatinggi, I was surprised and actually quite disappointed at the lack of information there. That tunnel complex really made an impression on me. Again, because of my history of reading about, you know, the Japanese labor projects all across Asia and POW camps and putting, you know, people to work building these things. I have kind of a lifelong interest in it. And here, out of nowhere, you know, I, when I went to Bukatinggi, you know, I did research into tourist attractions, things like that. And I think this tunnel complex was sort of hardly mentioned at all. It was just sort of an aside. And then when I went to see it, you know, it was like, boom, mind was blown at how big it was, how extensive it was. And I thought, man, what is the history of this place? And yet when you go to visit it, there is no history. Like there's almost nothing there, no documentation. Um, again, if you compare it to what happened to Western POWs, you talk about the 139 Western POWs that were killed 
at the POW camp in Palawan that has, you know, a big monument to the men killed. We know the name of every single soldier who was killed, I believe. You know, families know about it. It's part of the history. There are memoirs written, books written, you know, big monument that you can go visit, you know, talking about what happened and you can read about it. And then Kinkaseki, you know, the POW camps in Taiwan, same thing. All the men who died at Kinkaseki, we know who they all are. There are photographs of them. Um, there are stories about what happened to them, memoirs written, websites. You know, your big, big monuments with the names of all the men who died, all the prisoners who were held in these camps. The family members are aware of that. You know, the men who survived from these camps tell stories about that. There's just so much information about what happened. But then, if you alter your perspective by a little bit, you see that as this was happening to the Western POWs, far worse, usually, was happening to the local people. So like, I don't have the numbers at the, at the tips of my fingers right now, but if you read, for example, about the railroad in Thailand that the Japanese built with POWs and local forced labor, you always see numbers, like how many prisoners died, British prisoners, American prisoners, Canadian prisoners, Australian prisoners, how many of them died, their names. But then there will be another paragraph talking about the local Thai workers or the you know, Asian workers that were brought in from all over Asia. Far more of them died than the Western prisoners of war, like a much, much, much greater number but then they're just sort of mentioned as, okay, this many tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of local people died. And that's it. There's no identification for who these people were, very little information known about them. But you, you pick up on that pattern over time that if there's some sort of a, you know, incident involving Western POWs, we know everything down to the last detail of what happened. But right beside that killing, far more local people died in the battle or in whatever it was. And yet those are kind of faceless people. And I found that at Bukatingi as well, like assuming that local laborers were used to build these tunnels, you have to assume that just as the Western POWs in Kenkiseki were half starved, beaten, brutalized, and died while they were mining for copper in the copper mines at Kenkiseki, surely the same thing was happening to the Indonesian laborers in Bukitinggi, that a lot of them died during the construction of the tunnels, and yet there is no mention of that anywhere. Like there's no plaque, there's no memorial, there's no website, there's no history of how these tunnels were built. Like I, I still don't know. I haven't been able to get any information about how these tunnels were built. Um, like what was there a labor camp? Like were hundreds or thousands of laborers brought from Java and kept in some kind of a prisoner camp, a labor camp, and then every day, you know, the Japanese soldiers would force them to go into the tunnels and keep digging, and then every night they go back? Or were the tunnels built by local laborers from the Bukatingi area, and they just come from the villages every day, work all day, and then go home at night? Or was the majority of the labor done by the Japanese themselves? I mean, they were well versed in digging tunnels. They were highly skilled at it. I mean, as I said, I did a deep dive into Iwo Jima and a big part of the story of Iwo Jima is that the Japanese built massive underground tunnel systems there so that when the allies came and just bombed the island, I mean, with everything they had, you know, 500, 600 ships, bomber raids, and they just pounded this island for, I think, for like 72 hours straight, like what, what must have been one of the most massive artillery barrages in history. They just bombed this island to nothing, 
and yet it hardly did any damage at all to the Japanese because they were all underground in their tunnels and there was no, la no local labor on Iwo Jima. You know, it was only the Japanese. There was nobody else there. So they dug all these tunnels themselves. So that made me think about the Bukatingi tunnel complex. Well, who did dig most of the digging? Like maybe the Japanese soldiers did most of the labor themselves or was most of the labor done by Indonesians and were they local conscripted laborers or from nothing? I mean, I just don't know because there is no documentation of any kind. The, the tunnels are presented as, you know, big holes in the ground and that's about it. And I don't know how it happened, probably just something, an accidental thing where I was reading about all this stuff, watching YouTube videos about all this stuff. And then at one point, I think a video showed up on YouTube about the battle for Iwo Jima. And that, again, that is nothing new to me. I know I've done tons of deep dives in my past into the battle for Iwo Jima, Guadalcanal, you know, the, the fire bombing of Japan, all these, you know, things about the, uh, the Pacific uh, campaign in World War II. I've always been, I've always found it kind of interesting. But anyway, I think a, a video showed up in my feed. It was something I'd never seen before where it was like one video in color that pulled together all of the footage available of the bombardment of Iwo Jima before the Marines landed. And I have to say that when it comes to really understanding things, I'm an idiot. Like if I read something about what happened, so I'm reading about Iwo Jima and about how the Americans softened up the island with bombing beforehand and they had so many destroyers and battleships, you know, with their guns, you know, shooting shells at the island and bombs going overhead, dropping bombs. I read about all that. They tell me how many shells were fired, how long it went on, you know, 72 hours before the landing began, all this kind of stuff. I'm going, oh yeah, okay, cool, cool, cool. But I still don't really understand what it means because I'm just too dumb to grasp it. And then in this video, I don't think I'd seen a lot of this footage before. They showed a lot of this firing of artillery shells from the ships. And the scale of it was mind blowing. Just it's like, whoa, okay, that's what you're talking about. I mean, it was, it was just awe inspiring to see. And even the gun crews, you, I, you know, again, I'm so dumb and I have no experience with military things. I think of men firing these massive shells it sort of feels like it must take a couple of minutes between each shell maybe even longer you know you load the gun and everybody's like everybody clear 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 you know you aim the gun and shoot okay now let's you know get rid of that shell let's get the new shell and let's do this and let's make sure we got the gun aiming right and you know five minutes later you shoot another one but of course the reality is it's just massive shell in boom boom out in boom out in i mean they're just they're firing these huge shells like just seconds apart and then every one of these ships is just like boom, pouring artillery fire onto iwo jima it's just it's incredible to see and the fact that it did almost no damage to the japanese forces is just kind of mind numbing, you know, and um, anyway, after watching that video, it kind of <laughs> rekindled my interest in Iwo Jima. That's when I went down, you know, the rabbit hole and I, I watched a few more uh, videos. There's one in particular that was fascinating. It was about an hour long and it was an animated history of the entire battle from Iwo Jima from beginning to end. And by animated, I don't mean it was a cartoon showing humans. It was actually just a map of the island with all the detail of the island. Um, Surabashi, the, the hill on one side, you know, the big mountain on one side and all the strongholds for the Japanese, like everything marked in detail. And then you saw 
all the ships in detail, the fortifications, and then as they describe the history of the battle, you see little men kind of moving and tanks and fire tanks, you know, moving around Iwo Jima. So as they describe the history, you actually see it being played out on this map. So that's what they meant by animated. And it was amazing to watch. I watched the whole thing from beginning to end and just sort of paused all the time just to absorb what was going on. And yeah, it was such a, a fascinating uh, history. And I thought I knew a little bit about Iwo Jima, but this, uh, this hour-long history filled in so many gaps of exactly how that battle unfolded. And one of the things I don't think I knew, like maybe I came across this little factoid before, but I don't remember it because the one thing that everybody knows about Iwo Jima is the raising of the American flag, right? That's a, probably, probably the most famous picture from the Pacific campaign of World War II, maybe the most famous picture from all of World War II, you know, the raising of the flag, the American flag on Iwo Jima. It's just a classic image that everybody knows and you have a certain idea of how that happened. I think most people, they see that image, they think, oh, the battle is over, the Americans defeated the Japanese, and now they're raising the flag. Well, there are two things wrong with that story, two very big things. The main one is the battle hadn't even begun yet. The battle, the real battle was far from over because the Marines landed on the shore. It was like the only real landing point on the whole island that you know, was usable to them. And it was right at the base of Surabashi. I'm hoping I've got the name of that mountain right. And the Japanese, of course, had heavy, heavy fortifications built into this volcanic mountain. And then the Marines landed right underneath that. And then they, the first days of fighting, the Americans managed to take that mountain. And then it was on the top of that mountain, they raised the flag. But that was just the beginning of the battle. Um, the whole rest of the island was still occupied by the Japanese. Their main forces were still there on the other side of the island. So even though the Marines had taken that point and raised the flag, that wasn't the end of the battle. That was actually just the start of it. And it went on for much, much longer, you know, as they had to take uh, the rest of the island. So that's one misconception about that moment in history. And the other bigger, well, not bigger, but interesting misconception is that, in fact, that raising of the flag of, with the photograph isn't the real one. Because they raised the flag twice. And this second time was a little bit of a photo op. I wouldn't call it fake, but it wasn't the real raising of the flag because the first time it happened, um, the fighting was still ongoing. Um, there was a, a, a patrol of four Marines were sent because you know the fighting had been going on and on and on, and then everything kind of went quiet, and then they sent out this patrol to see what the heck is going on. And they went up the mountain and they made it all the way to the top. And there was very little Japanese resistance, you know, because they had pretty much wiped out um, all the Japanese um, on, on this mountain. They had taken all of the fortifications by that point. And then the four guys on patrol were kind of up at the top going, hmm, like, it looks, it looks okay. And then they sent up another troop, uh, I think like 14 Marines was going to go up and reinforce them and join them and somebody gave them an American flag and says listen like when you get to the top raise this flag and then all our forces all the ships all the other soldiers they'll see that flag and they'll get a boost of inspiration from it so these 14 Marines also went up to the top and then that was the first the original raising of the flag and when the flag went up everybody could see it and all the ships you know started blasting their horns and they were everyone was shooting guns in the air it was a big celebration to see the american flag being raised it was their first big victory on iwo jima 
And then while they were there doing that, a bunch of Japanese soldiers came out of a bunker because this was a big part of Iwo Jima that the Japanese had so many underground tunnels and complexes they could move around freely underground. And you think you've defeated the enemy because nobody's shooting back at you anymore, but then the Japanese might be all underground still and then suddenly they just pop up from underground. So while the Marines were raising the first flag, all these Japanese came out of this one tunnel and then just started shooting at the Marines. And so they were actually under fire during the time of the first flag raising. Um, astonishingly, I don't think anybody was hit, nobody was killed. The Marines returned fire and they killed all the Japanese. None of the Marines were hit and then they raised that flag. But that was the official flag raising the first one and the original one, but I guess there was some kind of a politi an American politician, like in the, in, the, in the defense department of the government, Forrestal, I think his name was, he happened to be there on a ship and he wanted that flag. This is the story that I heard a couple of times, I'm watching all these videos, and he wanted that flag as a souvenir and he was gonna bring it back to Washington. And then the local military officers, you know, the generals or whoever they were, got heard about this, that this politician was going to come ashore and he wanted to take that flag and keep it as a souvenir. And of course, the generals went, no, 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 that's not going to happen. And what they did was stage a second flag raising. They actually found another flag, a much, much bigger one. The first one that had been raised was a relatively small flag, but they found a big one and they sent it up onto the hill. And that big one being raised is when that photograph was taken. And there was being, and then, you know, the politician, I think he got that flag um, to take it away as a souvenir. So in a way it was, it was a fake out to trick this politician because they didn't want to give him the real flag, you know, they thought that should stay on the island because, you know, the Marines were the ones who did all the fighting and the dying. So yeah, that has been occupying my mind a little bit over the last couple of days. Yeah, the battle for uh, Iwo Jima. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's quite a, one of the biggest stories coming out of World War II and, you know, out of the Pacific campaign in particular really kind of interesting and I kind of I kind of got there because of you know just talking about the Japanese in general you know the occupation of Indonesia and then you know the comments that uh, that I received so yeah that's what you get on a planet dug behind the scenes you know whatever it is I'm uh, thinking about uh, coming back down to earth more about um, planet Doug specific kinds of things. I did have a little bit of a small adventure the other day related to my uh, YouTube channel and that is I got name cards printed. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of an interesting story for, uh, for me because it illustrates how dumb I am and like a weird quirk that I have because it's like almost everything seems really difficult from a distance and I need to be eased into everything. Like the first time I'm going to do something, I guess I kind of turned it into this big deal in advance in my head and I really resist doing it. And then if I figure out how to do it, it's like, oh, well, that was so easy. Why didn't I do that 20 years ago sort of thing? And then once I figure out how to do it, if someone shows me how to do it or that it's possible and it's suddenly like, oh, then I just do it all the time. You know, da, 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 da. But that first time, it's like I really need to be guided. The, you know, the first time that I do anything, I just find it daunting for some reason. And uh, <laughs> that's kind of true of this name card business because I wanted to get name cards a while ago for my Planet Doug YouTube channel. And I find it helps to feel official. For example, I, I think I, I started thinking about name cards when I was in Mesot in Thailand. And then I was doing a lot of 
uh, YouTube videos or I might go to a local <clears throat> coffee shop or something like that and, and, and profile this coffee shop on my uh, YouTube channel. And it always feels a little bit weird to just, you got your GoPro and then here's the coffee shop and then you just sort of open the door and walk in and you're like filming the entire coffee shop and you, it's like you're an invading YouTuber just sort of coming in. And I want it to be a little bit more official than that, a little bit more organized. And what I would, what I would want to do is go up to the owner of the coffee shop beforehand and say, you know, yeah, I have this YouTube channel and, um, you know, it's called Planet Doug or <laughs> maybe it was called The Cycling Canadian back then. I'm not sure when I changed the name. And is it okay if I come in here with my GoPro and shoot some video of your coffee shop? And you know, get permission to do it and establish a connection with the owner or with the staff in general. And it just felt good to do that. But every time I did that, it felt like something was missing because then I have to tell them the name of my channel, oh, Planet Doug, and they always get out their phone and they're like, okay, oh, what is it again? And they can't spell Planet or Doug, and it ends up being this big thing. And I started thinking, you know, it'd be nice to have an, a business card. And then you just go in and say, hi, you know, I'm Doug. I have a YouTube channel. Here's my card. There's the name of it. Is it okay if I, you know, make a video about your coffee shop? So I had that idea. And I thought, you know, you're out there, you're meeting people all the time. You're walking around with your GoPro and people talk to you and they say, oh, you know, do you have a YouTube channel? And then you get into this whole, yes, I do. And it's called Planet Doug. And oh, how do you spell that? Oh, give me your phone. Let me type it in. And I thought, you know, it'd be really handy just to have a little piece of paper, a little business card. You know, here, here's, here's the name of my uh, YouTube channel. So the obvious thing to do at that point would be to go to a print shop and say to them you know i would like to have business cards made up and i want this information on it and these graphics and and kind of do it that way but i didn't know how to do that it was like well how do, how do you do that and of course in thailand i find there was a big big language barrier and just a communication barrier in general and i kind of dreaded going into one of these official like a commercial printing shop and then of course you walk in and all the staff are going to freak out because a foreigner has come in they're all going to run away and it's going to be this unpleasant experience trying to communicate and i don't know what to do like what's the starting point for getting business cards made i didn't have any graphics i didn't ah uh, so basically i just hesitate to dive into something new like that. I, I, so what I did, I sat down on my computer and I made my own. Um, I think I found some kind of a program online, maybe it was Canva, and then I found a template for a business card that was pre-made and I just removed all the elements from that template and inserted my own. So whatever the name was on the card, I took it out and replaced it with Planet Doug and, and I put in a photo of me and I chose colors and did these things. And then I saved it as a PDF. But again, I, I didn't know, like, could I give this PDF to a business and now they can make the name card? And I assumed it would take three weeks, you know, that's, oh, it's gonna take such a long time. So what I did was I took my newly designed name card very basic very primitive looking thing and then i copied and pasted it eight times on one eight and a half by 11 inch sheet so i had a pdf with eight copies of my business card and then i just went to a photocopier a color photocopier and then i just put i printed out one copy of it in color and then i just made photocopies of that sheet and then I would sit here in my hotel room watching a documentary about Iwo Jima and I would sit here with a pair of scissors and then over a couple of hours I would just cut out, you know, a couple hundred business cards, you know, with a pair of scissors. And that's what I've been doing for the past two or three years as I, you know, when I run out of business cards, I just make more photocopies and I just cut them out, you know, and it's just because I couldn't get over this barrier of going into a business and figuring out how to do it properly. 
So here I am in Port Dixon and I've run out of name cards and I was going to go make more photocopies and then cut them out with scissors as I normally do. And I thought, I don't know what, let's, you know, we have time here and we're in Malaysia where it's a lot easier to communicate with people. Why don't I give this a try? <clears throat> so I tracked down a couple of print shops here in Port Dixon, located them on Google Maps, got on my bicycle, rode into Port Dixon. I had this eight and a half by 11 sheet on a flash drive, the, the PDF file. The first print shop, I couldn't find it. It, was, it had a pin on Google Maps, but I think the pin was wrong. And no matter how long I looked, I couldn't find it. But there was a second one called, uh, I should probably give the name of the place, give them a little plug, because I got such great service from them. It was like Boston PD uh, something or other. There it is. Boston Design and Printing PD. So Boston Design and Printing uh, Port Dixon. Turned out to be a little shop right on the corner and it was open. So it, it's not like you had to go into a building. You didn't close doors behind you or anything. It was just a counter. And to be honest, I was freaking out a little bit because these things on Planet Doug normally don't go well. They really don't where I go up to the counter and then I'm waiting for service and then something will go wrong. Nobody will come to the counter. I won't be able to understand what they say. The whole thing will just fall apart and I'll end up feeling upset and irritated, irritated and stressed out and, and I won't be able to get it done. And then I won't know even how to do it, what questions to ask, how to get there. It'll just be a disaster. Every time I try to do something like this, I think this is, this is gonna be bad. So I'm, I'm riding my bike up to Boston, uh, design and printing. Yep. And you know, then I'm parking my bike and I'm moving really slowly because I'm dreading the moment of going up to the counter. I'm like, oh man, this is, this is not gonna be, this is not gonna go well. This is gonna be bad. But I thought, oh, just, you know, I, I draw on my, what would Harrison Ford do persona? Like Doug, me, I'm a timid little fawn, you know, going up to, into one of these situations and I'm sort of stressed out. But I'm like, okay, just what would Harrison Ford do if he were here? He wouldn't be stressing out. Like just what would Harrison Ford do? And I just sort of take a deep breath and all right. So I get out my flash drive and I'm just like, okay, just man up, right? Man up, just do, just do this. And I go up to the counter and at first, at first I thought, all of my worst fears were going to be realized because there was a man back there, like there's no one at the counter, but there was a man and a young woman. And then as I came up to the counter, both of them looked at me and they, they kind of were a little bit startled. It was like, oh, you know, I, I could just see the change in their faces. You know, it's like, oh, foreigner, you know, and, and they didn't come up to the counter. Like they were busy doing something, but they kind of looked up at me and then did this. And then they went back to whatever they were doing. And my first reaction was, okay, here we go. Once again, I'm going to be ignored because that happens to me all the time. I go into businesses, I wait politely at the counter, and then I wait there for five minutes, 10 minutes, and nobody ever comes. I just get completely ignored. And eventually I get all irritated and frustrated and stressed out. And I just turn around and I leave and I vow never to go back again. You know, that happens to me frequently. So I thought, oh, here we go. This is what's going to happen here. But then um, the man came over to the counter and I'm just sort of about to, you know, say something to him. And then another person, another customer came beside me, came right up to the counter and they had some sort of something in a bag or a receipt. I can't remember what it was. And they come, they're talking even as they're coming up to the counter, you know, like whatever their service is, whatever it is they, they want, they're already announcing what they want. You know, they go, uh, and they put their hand in front of me and hand the guy whatever this thing was. So of course he, was coming to me, but then he shifted to this other person and helps them. 
and they go through their whole transaction. Meanwhile, I'm standing there and I'm, you know, waiting politely for my turn. And then he's about to come back to me. But meanwhile, a crowd of people has built up. I'm like, oh, of course, you know, this place is probably empty, you know, most of the time. But the, the minute that I show up, there's like five people suddenly in line because they all want photocopies they all want print jobs done they want this they want the other and all these people just keep coming up to the counter again and again and again and they keep waiting on them waiting on them waiting on them and to be honest i didn't mind that i was still being ignored because i would feel uncomfortable getting my service and have all these people waiting for me to finish because I know whatever it is I'm going to do is going to take a while. I'm a dummy. I'm an idiot. I'm a moron. I'm going to have questions. All these people, they know what they're doing. They're like, oh, I need 25. I need 100 copies of this in color, double-sided, da, 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 da. They fill out the receipt, stamp, stamp. Here's the money. They're gone. Everybody knows what they want, what to say, how to get what they want. But I'm going to have questions. I'm like, okay, um, I want business cards, but... I have this PDF, I made it myself, it's on this flash drive, it's like an eight and a half by 11 sheet, and I'm gonna have to give him the flash drive. He's gonna have to take it back into the office, plug it into his computer, but of course I've got 500 files and folders on that flash drive. I'm gonna have to tell him, okay, what folder to open, which document I'm talking about. I'm gonna have to ask him questions about how long it's going to take, how much it's going to cost, about the design, this, that. It, I, know, I know me and I know my style and it's going to take a while to work out all these details. And if there's five people waiting in line behind me, I'm not going to feel comfortable. So while all these people were coming to the counter, I was trying to convey with my body language that that's okay. Like, deal with them first. Sure, I was here first, like I was at the head of the line, but I'll, I'm going to step aside. And I kind of indicated that I'm cool waiting. Like, let's deal with all these people, get them all their business taken care of. When you're free and there's no more customers, then we can deal with the dummy, you know, from Planet Doug. So, you know, I'm standing there and, and I, again, I want to indicate to the guy that this is okay. I'm not bothered by you helping them instead of me. I want that to happen. So I'm kind of looking at my phone and pretending that I'm busy, that, okay, well, I'm not quite ready yet anyway. So yeah, you know, help, help them first and I'll get this figured out. And, and then eventually the crowd of people died down. It went, it went on for a while and I thought, good grief, like we're all you people just sitting at home waiting for me to show up at the photocopy place and then he's oh doug's there doug's there let's all go at once let's rush the place and overwhelm it with i was like because it looked empty when i showed up that's the only reason i stopped it was because it was completely empty there were no customers the two staff were like in the back doing other things they weren't even at the counter because there were no customers but a second i walked up to the counter there was like a, a stampede of people who needed photocopies. <laughs> you know, I'm like, oh, of course. Anyway, so I kind of held back and I waited. And then finally, the guy turned to me and there were issues mainly because of me being an idiot. I have no idea what I'm doing or what I'm talking about. Like, I don't even know what to say to him, like what I want, because... I need all this information first. Like, I don't know if I even want name cards printed because it depends how expensive it is. Can you even do it? How long will it take? Like, I need all these questions answered before I can even start deciding what it is I want to do. And I don't like moving fast. I'm a very slow moving sloth like creature when it comes to these sorts of arrangements. So, you know, we're working, I'm trying to, and I think he's assuming that I'm smarter than I actually am because all the other customers, they know what they want. They're familiar, you know, maybe they had business cards printed there before and they're just renewing their order. Oh, can I get 500 more of these? You know, da, 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 away they go. Me, I've got a million questions before I can even get started. 
But the guy, very friendly, spoke English very well, very helpful, and he fought through all of my misconceptions and misunderstandings. And we, ha you know, <laughs> kind of funny because I've got this um, flash drive. It's a bit of a unique one, I guess, because it has USB-A on one side and USB-C on the other. Or no, actually, I think it's an older one, USB, um, like it's the micro USB-C, you know, on the other side. But it's inside this plastic housing and you have to push it this way to get USB-A or this way to get the other port, you know, you have to figure out. And somehow it gets a little bit complicated once you push it out. And then if you hold it wrong and try to push it into the port, it won't go in because it'll just stick out the other side. You have to hold it in a certain way to get the port to plug, to get the plug to plug, plug into the port. And I'm very familiar with it. And usually when I go to a photocopy place or a printing place, I try to get behind the counter because I know it's going to be so much easier. Like, just let me do it. Like, let me sit down at your computer. I take this out. I know how to plug it in. I know how to open it. I know what folder to open. I know what document I want. Like, can I come back? But in this place, there was no real way to do that. So all once we had you know, gone through some of my preliminary questions. Then I gave the guy the flash drive and he took it. And then he went away from me like 10 or 15 feet to their laptop computer. And now he's back there looking at my flash drive. And he's like, I could, I knew he was going to struggle. And he was, he was like, how, how do I put, how do I open this? How do I push it? And he finally got, okay, that's what it is. And then he tried to put it into his port on his laptop and every time he tried to push it in it just stuck out the other side because you have to hold it in a certain way in order to get a grip on it and he's like yeah yeah he's fighting and fighting and fighting and i'm like uh, uh, uh. i want to get back there so badly to do it for him because i know that even if he ever does get it in now he won't even know what file what folder to open so now i'm going to be shouting at him in english no not that it's called, you know, the, it, 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 you know, it's like, oh, it'd be so much easier if I could just do it myself. But anyway, he's in there. He picked up the laptop and he's holding it in the air and he's, he, he can't get that thing in. And then the young woman came over and said, you know, let, let me, let me try. Now she's involved. She takes the flash drive and they're trying to figure it out. Eventually they get it in. And then they put the laptop back down and then they, they open it. Other customers have been coming during this time and he has to help them a little bit. And he keeps, you know, whenever he has free time, he eventually goes back to his laptop. And then uh, he, he needed to know what folder and I, he did speak English. So I said, oh, it's called Planet Doug. And I, I planned this in advance. I made sure there was only one file in the Planet Doug folder. So then it wouldn't be that confusing. So there's, you know, open Planet Doug, and he found it, opened that folder, and there's only one file there. So then he opened it, took a look at it, you know, we talked about it. And again, I wasn't really sure whether this was going to work or not, because as I said, I, I made this PDF myself, and each card was exactly the same size as a business card because I make photocopies. So I don't know whether you can take that graphic, take it out, put it into the official business card program, and will the resolution be high enough? Because I have a photograph of me eating noodles on my card for some reason, and I have all these things, and I have colors, it's red and white, and I wasn't sure whether you could cut it out and paste it in, and now will it be all pixelated, uh, or does it need to be giant size, and then you reduce it to a small size in order to get sharp resolution? I didn't know, I didn't know any of this. And then it turned out that everything was easy. He looked at it and he said, yeah, I can do this, no problem. Oh, just like that, yeah. It's like, so again, I, I want to confirm like, okay, but the size of it, you can make it fit and you don't have to rebuild it or recreate, you can just copy and yep, no problem. It's like, oh, 
cool. I wasn't expecting it to be so easy. And then I says, well, and how, like, I don't know whether I want to do it or not. It depends on how long it's going to take. Like, how long will it take? Like, I was expecting one week, two weeks, three weeks, you know. That's my experience with the world. And then he said, uh, he, he thought for a second, he says, uh, not tomorrow. Said, what? Blah, 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 blah. What? <laughs> you know, he said, no, tomorrow. Yeah, like, what do you mean tomorrow? Yeah, tomorrow afternoon, you know, maybe in the morning, you know, we'll do it. It'll be all ready. I was like, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> what? Am I in some sort of fantasy land? What is happening right now? And um, I was like, yeah, okay. Yeah, let's, uh, let's do it. You know, I asked him how much it was going to cost. And to be honest, at this point, I wanted to pump the brakes. Because it turns out it was going to be easy to do. I could get it done overnight. And if it's that easy, well, maybe I should improve the design of the card. Because I made this card I'm like an amateur two or three years ago. And I have this, I picked this picture of me to put on the card. But the only reason I picked it was because it was like one of the only pictures I had. I was moving fast. I was looking on my laptop and I thought, oh, there's a, there's a screenshot of me eating some noodles. And I look like I have kind of a smile on my face. And I thought, oh, I'll just grab that, crop it, stick it in. Okay, that's good. But it's not like it was, wow, this picture is the best picture that represents Planet Doug and who I am. I love this picture. No, it just happened to be the one that was sitting on my computer that day, and it kind of fit. But now, ever since I've been using that card, when I give it to people, they look at it, say, oh, you're a food vlogger. And I'm like, well, no, not really. Sometimes I have food in my videos, but I'm not a food vlogger. And like, well, you're eating noodles. Like, you look so happy eating these noodles. Like, why did you pick a picture of you eating noodles if you're not a food vlogger? And I'm like, because ah, I'm a moron, I guess. I, I don't know. But anyway, so as soon as it's, I realized it was going to be so easy to make these cards, I thought, hmm, maybe I should kind of make it better, like make sure it's what I want. But at the same time, I had gotten i had to work so hard to get to this point in our in my negotiations with boston design and printing i really did not want to stop because once i have some momentum going let's just let's do it like once i've got some communication okay let's get it done because if i stop and i come back everything's going to fall apart, nothing's going to work. So I thought, okay, let's just continue. And then it turns out you can get, you know, you have to order a certain number of them, you know, in the hundreds. And the minimum order was 300. So it's basically three boxes, right? Each box is 100 cards. That's the minimum order. And it was 95 ringgit minimum for the three boxes. And to be honest, in my head, I didn't even know how much money that was. I was like, oh, is that expensive? Is that cheap? Is that good price? Terrible price? I have no idea. Um, I, you know, I wasn't really thinking that clearly. And then I said, uh, yeah, okay, I'll get, you know, I didn't really need 500 and this sort of thing. Let's just go for the minimum. 300 let's do that 95 ringgit. And then we're, we're busy setting this up. And then it was like, oh, shoot. It's like, oh, I don't think I even have 95 ringgit, right? So I, I get out my wallet and, you know, you open your wallet and the moths come fluttering out. It's like, oh, <laughs> very embarrassing. You know, I'm, here I am, Mr. Big Businessman at the uh, printing shop getting some business cards for my uh, successful YouTube channel. And I'm, I'm placing the order. And then, <laughs> and then I turn to the guy shamefacedly and I'm like, actually, I don't even have any money. Um, so I was like, yeah, that, that's going to throw a kink in our proceedings. So now I'm going to have to, you know, leave here, come back to the hotel. I have a little bit of money tucked away back here, get some money and, and, and go back again. But then the modern world kind of saved me. And th this was kind of interesting because I'm a little bit slow on the uptake. But then I started to think that, well, you know, these days, People don't use money anyway. 
So maybe there's an alternative way to pay. And I do have, you know, t a touch and go e-wallet. And I thought, oh, ooh, ooh, maybe, you know, you know, Planet Doug is getting all modern here. And then I, I said to the guy, I says, oh, actually, I have, like, can I pay with touch and go, like e-wallet? And he says, yeah, of course. You know, like, well, don't, you know, it's not of course for me, because to me, that's like a modern marvel of technology. Like, it never even occurred to me you could go to a print shop, get business cards made, have them done overnight so easily, and then just sort of whip out your phone and pay with your phone. I mean, to other people in the world, they're like, well, duh, that's how the world works now. But, you know, for me, you know, on Planet Doug, that is not how things generally work. But anyway, he was like, yeah, you can go, uh, we can do the touch and go thing. And he has, you know, the QR code on a plaque, on a plastic thing on his desk. And he says, yeah, here you go, just scan that. And I knew how to do this from my previous times in Kuala Lumpur. So, you know, I opened up my touch and go e-wallet and I was like, ah, oh, I, I actually had 95 ringgit in my touch and go e-wallet. Um, it's like, oh, I, oh I, maybe this will actually work. And I worked through the system and scanned his QR code. And um, of course, I originally put 95 in the wrong place. There's like a, the, where you put in the number, how much you pay. And then there's another line where you write notes or something. And of course, I'm putting 95 ringgit in the notes. And I'm like, how come it's not working? It's like, oh, the, another customer <laughs> who was waiting patiently behind, beside me for his chance to get his job done, he kind of leaned over. It's like, no, you, you got to put it up there, dude. It's like, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I put the 95 in the right place. But then, of course, you need even more technology because I, you know, I paid the guy and then I showed him, you know, confirmed payment, uh, 95 ringgit through touch and go. Here it is. And then, but he wanted a copy of that. So he, he kind of took my phone and he wanted to do a screenshot. And he's like, okay, oh, what buttons do you use? And so I took the phone back and I'm like, okay, I can make a screenshot. You push these two buttons at the same time, take a screenshot. And he says, yeah, please send that to me on WhatsApp. So now, now we're going to this whole thing where he's got his phone out, I've got my phone out, we both load up WhatsApp and, and I have to scan his QR code or he has to scan mine and we have to add each other as uh, contacts and then I finally have him as a contact on WhatsApp and then I can send him a copy of this touch and go receipt and I make a, I'm very, I'm being very professional now. I even add a little notation, you know, you know, touch and go payment for uh, 300 Planet Doug business cards. You know, I write all this out, save it with the uh, screenshot, send it to him, and now he's got that. And then he says to me, you know, like, oh, you know, now that I have, you know, have you on WhatsApp, um, you know, I will send you a message to let you know when the job is done. And I'm like, uh, I'm in awe at this point at my ability to keep my head above water in this modern world of technology. I'm like, ha, you know, patting, patting myself on the back. Planet Doug is ordering business cards overnight and paying for them online digitally. You know, <laughs> I'm, very, I'm very proud of myself that I managed to get all this uh, figured out, right? So I'm really happy about this. I love getting things done. Um, it, I was thinking about this yesterday that as I was riding my bike from Port Dixon back to this hotel, I was just feeling happy. I was feeling excited, like I was getting something done. And I realized that the video editing process for a YouTube channel is so cumbersome, so slow and so annoying and frustrating. You, you, you build up this level of stress because for me anyway, it's so hard to get it done. And you just feel like you're stuck in molasses. You just feel like you're stuck in the mud. There isn't a lot of excitement in it because you're not making any progress. It's so slow. And somehow getting these business cards made was so fun because it feels like I was doing something practical and interesting and exciting. And it was like, oh, wow, I'm getting things done. You know, I'm making business moves out here with Planet Doug. It was just such a contrast with editing and uploading video, which is such a slow, painstaking process. 
it was actually a lot of fun to get business cards made you know the 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 mood was so different but anyway i come back here i'm basking in the glow of this successful errand and then i get a whatsapp message from boston design and he sent me a mock-up amazing right he was like okay you know he, he was working on it he took my design carved it out and he pasted it into whatever his system is and he was sizing it properly and doing whatever it is he needs to do and he put together a mock-up and then he sent me a picture of it like what do you think and it turns out he's like a million times smarter than I am because I had completely forgotten that in my original design I had made two so I had an eight and a half by 11 PDF of one design. It's white, a white background with some information on it. And then below it was another eight and a half by 11 sheet. I had completely forgotten I had done it of a different design with a red background and slightly different information. I forgot it was there. But when he went to create the mock-up, you know, he was looking at my PDF and he went, oh, white ones at the top red ones at the bottom and him being a genius me you know being the moron he just said well i'll put the white one on the front and the red one on the back and of course he sent me this message like wait what do you think white on the front red on the back and i was like oh man genius because i didn't even know it was double-sided I, this whole time, I was just assuming that I was getting a business card with, you know, printing on the front and then blank on the back. It never even occurred to me that, you know, for your 95 ringgit for 300 cards, it's double-sided. He knew that. I get, this, had, this hadn't even come up in all of our discussions. He never mentioned it because to him, it's, it's obvious. Of course it's double-sided. Like what kind of a moron <laughs> thinks business cards are, are only on one side today? Of course it's double-sided, but it had never occurred to me. So he sent me this mock-up, white on one side, red on the other, and said front and back. And I was like, amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Let's do that. There was one issue though. And this is this kind of get back, gets back to this idea of me wanting to pump the brakes a little bit because when I put this card together long ago in Thailand, at that time, I was building up a Patreon account. You know, it's one of these things you can do for a YouTube channel where you create a Patreon account and then people who like what you're doing and are enjoying their videos, they can sign up for this Patreon and then they get special perks. So, you know, you, you, in Patreon, you can have tiers, you know, it's basically like a Planet Doug membership. You can become an exclusive member, a citizen of a Planet Doug, so to speak. And then for $1 a month, you can get this and for five dollars a month you can get this or you know whatever you basically have to build this patreon account series of tiers and for every payment tier you offer benefits whatever those might be and at that time i was thinking i would like to do this for planet doug so i'd opened a planet doug patreon account and I was busy constructing all these tiers and thinking about how to organize it and how to do it. So when I made up this business card mock-up, I included Planet Doug Patreon. So in the business card mock-up that I gave this guy, the Patreon is still there. And the red design was kind of a Patreon dedicated design because I have a little sentence at the bottom that says, you know, sign up for the Planet Doug Patreon for exclusive access. At that time, I had no idea what this exclusive access was going to mean, but you know, the, the language sounded good, you know, so I included it. And on the white design, I actually have, you know, Planet Doug, content creator, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Patreon. It's included on both sides, but of course, I don't actually have a Patreon. I never 
officially established a Patreon account. Mm -hmm. so, so even though Planet Doug Patreon doesn't exist, it is in the business card design because I was planning on doing it long ago. I just never actually finished it. So when he sent me the white and red, I saw on the red, you know, sign up for, you know, Planet Doug Patreon. I thought, ooh, yeah, that I should probably get rid of that because there is no Patreon. But at the same time, I was thinking, well, there could be. Like, <laughs> maybe in the future, I will do it. And as I said, since the project was in motion, the last thing I wanted to do was now stop it and tell him, oh, actually, I want to change the design, and now I have to rebuild the whole thing, save it as a PDF, go back to him and say, use this one instead. That was just going to cause all kinds of trouble. So even though it says Patreon on it, and there is no Patreon, I said to the guy, love the design, two-sided, never even occurred to me that it could be two-sided, but yeah, let's go with that. I was so, again, pleased with myself. And then the next morning, which was yeah, yesterday morning, um, quite early in the morning, you know, I got a WhatsApp message from Boston Design and Printing and said, your cards are ready. This was like 10 o'clock in the morning. They're all done. You can come pick them up. And I have them. This is uh, one box of them right here. I have three boxes in total. And I hopped on my bike and rode down to Boston Design and uh, picked them up. And, uh, you know, there they are. <laughs> this is the uh, red, the red side and the, uh, the white side. I mean, I've been using the same design, you know, for a long time. I, I've been handing these out for a while already. There's Planet Doug Red and then Planet Doug White. They're almost identical from one side to the other. And, and there's no phone number. Like most businesses, they have their phone numbers and street address, all that kind of business information. I don't have any of that because obviously Planet Doug doesn't have a phone number. I have a YouTube channel, Instagram page, email address, and Patreon. So there they are. Like, uh, <laughs> so exciting. So that was my adventure, my Planet Doug adventure recently. And um, yeah, I, I better start handing these things out because it turns out that 100 name cards, it's heavy. This is a heavy box. And I've got three of these things. So I, when the guy gave them to me in a bag, I was like, oh man, now I have to carry these around? You know, it's like, man, this is, I mean, that's heavier than a GoPro. Now it's sort of like adding three new GoPros to your luggage. It's like, yeah, that, that's heavy. Anyway, I'm so pleased with how easily this was done because I wasn't expecting it to be so easy. But now that I've done it once, I'm like, well, what was I so worried about? You know, why didn't I do this three years ago, you know? And while I was there, on a related note, I was looking at all the signs at his place and one sign caught my eye because he had a big poster talking about making stickers and that really got my attention because over the years watching YouTube videos you know you, particularly people that are on expeditions like anybody who's going around the world on a motorcycle or I think they're very popular in Asia like if there's a, a, a motorcycle club from Bangkok or something and they're gonna do the Mei Hong Sun loop 10 of them together on their motorcycles they always have stickers for their expedition you know they give their expedition a name Mei Hong Sun 2021 you know and they had they have a photo uh, an image of a motorcycle big big KTM adventure bike and you know it looks all very fancy and as they go around the Mei Hong Sun loop every time they stop at one of these fancy restaurants or cafes at the side of the road the door will be covered in stickers and they take one of their stickers and put it on the door you know to commemorate their trip around the Mei Hong Sun loop and then you know youtubers do it um, too up and overloaded one of the channels that I'm following right now they they had stickers so when you know a group of 
a bunch of children ar come around their motorcycle and are talking to them, they give the kids stickers because kids love stickers, right? And the sticker says, you know, too up and overloaded and has all their graphics on it. And the kids are so excited to get these stickers because they can stick them to their notebooks or to their whatever it is they have, you know, their knapsack, you know. And every time I saw these people with stickers, I was in awe of them. And I thought, wow, if only someday I could be that organized. It's like, wow, too up and overloaded. Look at their videos. They're so professional. They've got graphics. They've got a Patreon. They've got stickers. It's like, wow. Like to me, that just seemed so amazing. Like, how do you make stickers? Like, I didn't have a clue. I just assumed that anybody who has stickers must have like a graphics company working for them. I'm like, how do you know how to do all these things? How do you make stickers? Where do you get stickers? To me, it seemed like an impossible thing to do. And only the smartest, most organized people on the planet could have stickers. That's, that was my attitude towards them. So anyway, I'm at Boston Design. I just finished, you know, ordering these and I see the sign. This is actually, was it when I was picking them up? Yeah, I think it was when I was picking them up. I got up my courage to ask the guy because um, it was exhausting for me just to do the name cards and now to open up a whole new topic, stickers. It was like I needed, I needed some energy to do this, so I waited till the next day. I'm picking up my cards and I stopped the guy and said, um, like, how, how do these stickers work exactly? And again, it took us a while to work through the, the questions and answers because he was assuming all this knowledge on my part that well everybody knows this so he's telling me things but I felt like I was still missing the big picture because I'm like okay I, I get that I get but I still don't really understand what you're talking about because he said the stickers cost 25 ringgit and I'm like whoa that's an expensive sticker because I did notice that a lot of these people that have stickers, like two up and overloaded, they're always running out of them. Like they don't have enough stickers. So I'm thinking, oh, okay, if they cost 25 ringgit each, no wonder they're running out because who can afford to have 500 stickers at 25 ringgit a pop and just be handing them out to a bunch of kids? Yeah, that's like, I was like, 25 ringgit? I was like, okay, okay, I don't want stickers then because that's that's too expensive and we kind of went back and forth back and forth but I could feel like I was misunderstanding something I was missing a key piece of information and I kept sort of pressing and pressing and was like okay I don't I still don't really understand what you're saying how does this work again what do we how do? and then he went and got a physical prop to show me and then the light bulb went off it's like oh that's how it works turns out it was 25 ringgit per sheet per sticker sheet and how many stickers you got depended on how big your stickers were because you pay for the sheet it's 25 ringgit for one sheet and then if you have big round stickers you might be able to get four stickers on each sheet if your round sticker is smaller, maybe you can get six on each sheet. So for example, if I used this design as my sticker, he said, well, that size, like business card size, we can get 21, three rows of seven fits this sheet. So basically you would be paying 25 ringgit for 21 stickers. It all depends on the size and shape of your design. And apparently everyone in the world knows this, right? It's like, everybody knows this, but this, this moron, I didn't know that. It's like, oh, that's how it works. Okay, now I get it. And I said to the guy, well, let's assume I did use this as my sticker because I don't have anything else. I don't have Planet Doug graphics. I don't have any fancy graphics. I don't have anything, but it's like, I do have this right now. This is the only thing I have, this design. So 
if I say, okay, I want stickers like this, how long is that going to take? And again, I'm assuming one week, two weeks, three months, like, I, I don't know. And he says, oh, I can do it for you by tomorrow. I'm like, oh, for Pete's sake, really? You know, it's that easy to get stickers. You just walk into any print shop in the world, hand them something and say, you know, can I have a hundred of these stickers, please? And the guy will just say, oh, okay, no problem. Pick them up tomorrow, bing, bing, pay, and you get your stickers. I had no idea it was so easy to do, you know? Assuming you have some kind of a graphic in any form, you just give it to the guy at the print shop, and then the next day you get stickers back. So my, my sense of how amazing and how professional all these YouTubers are, you know, all the ones that have stickers, now I understand it's actually not that big a deal. Anybody can get stickers. I could get stickers. And when I was there, I was so close to getting stickers, like with this design, you know, I thought it'd be kind of fun to have a few. Of course, handing this out to little kids, like, oh, here's your Planet Doug sticker. They're probably not going to be that excited. Like, it looks like it's a business card, you know, like what, you work at IBM? Like, why do I want an IBM sticker? Like, am I going to put it on my shirt? You know, it's like they need something that looks a little bit more fun, you know, a little bit more interesting. But this is all I had. And I was standing there thinking, oh, OK, now that I understand it, maybe, you know, I'll get two sheets, three sheets. You know, it's not a lot, 25, uh, 21 per sheet. So you get 20. 21 or 42 or 63 stickers and I thought maybe while I'm here while we're having this conversation yeah why don't I just uh, get some stickers and I was just about to open my mouth and I thought well I still don't have any money you know there was no money in my wallet and you know I couldn't pay him in cash I hadn't brought any and then I realized oh on my touch and go e-wallet there wasn't enough money there to pay for stickers either so it was sort of like, okay, no, I, I can't even do it right now. So I, I kind of let it go, you know. But that was, yeah, that was my big Planet Doug adventure. Turns out getting business cards and stickers, easiest thing in the world. And I have no idea why I was so nervous about doing it in the past. Turns out there was no reason to be nervous. Once you get over that initial hurdle, now that I know how to do it, I'm an expert. I'll have no trouble doing it at any point in the future. But yeah, it is a weird thing in my personality that I have so much trouble doing anything the first time. I really have to fight hard to do something the first time. And once I do it once, I want to do it over and over and over again because now I know the system, right? And quite often in my life, I've had to rely on other people Again, I don't know if this is a common personality trait, but I figured out that it is part of my personality that I'll be out there traveling even, doing things, and then I'll meet another person and they introduce me to something. And that something is very interesting and exciting and wonderful. But on my own, I never would have gotten around to doing it. I needed somebody to hold my hand through the first time and then once I know oh I just do it all the time but on my own I never would have gotten around to doing it myself I need some sort of an introduction into it and once I figure out the system then then I'm the master you know I'll just do it over and over and over again but if I never get that initial bump that initial push into something it's very unlikely I'll ever do it myself you know, it's a bit of a, I think of it as a personality flaw that I need so much help to do something, you know, the first time. And it might be something I really, really like, but somehow on my own, I never would have done it on my own. I need that assistance, you know. So there you are. Planet Doug stories. I guess I was mainly talking about uh, Iwo Jima and uh, the Japanese uh, occupation of Indonesia. You know, just a little bit of a tangent from Planet Doug and then a Planet Doug uh, business card story, business card and uh, sticker story.
And all right, I think that is it for this morning. I'm going to uh, shut down behind the scenes and uh, I'll see you in the next video.